Hey guys, so I am recording this video to help you with your performance final, which remember is this Monday. Okay, now the performance final plus your final exam are going to be used for grade replacement. So if you listen up and focus and really try to learn and use your study guide, you might be able to still bring your grade up by a significant amount. So one thing that I want to remind us of when we're looking at a balanced chemical equation is about our coefficients here. So the 4, the 3, and the 2. Remember, those represent 4 moles of aluminum or 3 moles of oxygen or 2 moles of aluminum oxide. And I recommend that on your final exam or on your performance final when you're looking at a balanced chemical equation to write it down on some scrap paper and write the word mole out beside those numbers so that it reminds yourself that that's where we get our mole ratio from. Now if we look at our first problem it says how many grams of aluminum oxide are made by 25 grams of aluminum and remember you always want to start off with writing down what you have in the problem and what you want to find out. So in this case, we have 25.0 grams of aluminum. And it's important to write down three things, the number, the unit, in this case grams, and the chemical aluminum. And what do we want? Well, it says how many, and then we see our unit, grams of aluminum oxide, Al2O3. So when we've labeled what we have and what we want, we set up our t-chart, okay, and we put what we have in the first spot. Now when we are doing a t-chart, remember the pattern is always the same. If we have grams of aluminum in here, that means grams of aluminum must repeat, be repeated in the bottom of the next section. And any time we see grams, that is an indicator to us that we need to find our molar mass of whatever compound it is. Now remember, your molar mass is when you take you split up your elements. In this case, we only have one element. It's aluminum. And we look at how many of them we have. In this case, we have a divisible subscript 1, so we write a 1, and you multiply it by the atomic mass on the periodic table. Now remember, when you look at the periodic table, aluminum, you find its symbol 26.98 is written at the bottom, and so that tells you that we should multiply 1 times 26.98, which remains the same, and that is 26.98 grams. Now, we put our 26.98 grams in our t-chart and the definition of molar mass is the number of grams in one mole. So whenever you have grams, the other side is always one mole of whatever chemical it is. In this case, it's staying aluminum. Now, when you have something on the top and bottom of a fraction, um, it cancels out. So we have grams of aluminum are going to cancel out with grams of aluminum here and we have moles of aluminum left and if we look at that and compare it to what we want we see that those two things do not match and so therefore we have to keep going so we create a second step and we follow our pattern again whatever unit we have right now we put at the bottom of the next section so I'm gonna write moles of aluminum now when we're in moles that opens up for us our balanced chemical equation because remember we said that those coefficients were all about moles and so since I'm in moles that gives me the freedom to move between those three chemicals that are in the balanced chemical equation so when I look at it I see okay aluminum is the chemical I have and aluminum oxide is the chemical I want so those are the, the coefficients that I'm going to be looking at I'm going to put a 4 in, in my t-chart because there's a 4 as a coefficient. And then I'm going to put my 2 moles of aluminum oxide above it because that is what I'm changing. And that balanced chemical equation shows me the relationship between these two chemicals. 
And so I see that because I have moles of aluminum on the top and moles of aluminum on the bottom, they cancel out. And I'm going to check, does this match what I want? And it doesn't. I've got moles of aluminum oxide. I want grams of aluminum oxide, so it does not match. So I'm going to have to have a third step. Now again, we repeat our pattern. We bring down moles of aluminum oxide. And the part about this that I want to change, I want to keep aluminum oxide, but I need to change moles into grams. And as we said earlier, anytime you see grams, that means you need your molar mass of your chemical. Now the molar mass of aluminum oxide is going to be a little bit different because it's a bigger chemical. So we split up our elements. We have aluminum and oxygen, and we count how many I have. The two as a subscript tells me I have two aluminums, and for the oxygen, we have three of them. We multiply by their mass on the periodic table for aluminum, that's 26.98, and for oxygen, that is 16. Now, when we multiply across 2 times excuse me, 2 times 26.98 2 times 26.98 is equal to 53.96 and 3 times 16 is 48 and so we add them all together and we get 101.96 grams. So in our T-chart, we'll add the 101.96 grams to our chart. Remember, molar mass is always equal to one mole. And so now that we have plugged that all in, we see what units cancel out. So we see that moles of aluminum oxide are getting canceled out with moles of aluminum oxide. We check, does this match what we're looking for? And it does. It does match, which means that I can stop and plug everything into my calculator now that my problem is completely set up. And so when we put this in our calculator, remember that you have to multiply by what is on the top and divide by the things that are in the bottom. And you can go in any order you want as long as you start with 25. So in this case, it would be 25 times 1 divided by 26.98 times 2 divided by 4 times 101.96 divided by 1. And that will give you 47.24 grams of aluminum oxide as your final answer. Okay. Now if you do all of this, you will be able to show all of your work, you will get full credit, and you can be sure that with your units canceling out, you are setting up your problem correctly. So hopefully that made more sense maybe than you, it has in the past. So when you look at problem number two, you see that again we need to label what we have and what we want. So we have 15.0 grams of aluminum oxide and we want grams of O2 or oxygen. And so we again set up our t-chart with our 15.0 grams of aluminum oxide and we bring our grams of aluminum oxide down to the bottom and we know that anytime we have grams we need our molar mass which we calculated our molar mass in our first problem to be 101.96 and our molar mass is always equal to one mole of the same chemical. Now when we look at what cancels out grams of aluminum oxide, cancel out with grams of aluminum oxide. We check, does this match what I want? It does not, and so that means I have to keep going. So I bring moles of aluminum oxide to the bottom, and now that we're in moles, it opens up our balanced chemical equation, 
So let's take a look back at our equation. In our equation, the, in question one, aluminum and aluminum oxide were our chemicals of interest. But this time, we want or we have aluminum oxide and we want oxygen. So in this case, I'm going to be using a mole ratio of 2 to 3. So I have 2 moles of aluminum oxide for every 3 moles of oxygen. And so we look at our units that cancel out. Moles of aluminum oxide cancel out with moles of aluminum oxide. And we check, does moles of oxygen match what I want? It does not because we want grams of oxygen. So we create another step and we keep going. We bring moles of oxygen down and we know that the only thing about that we want to change is we want to change it to grams of oxygen. Grams of oxygen tells us that we need our molar mass. And so when we um, conduct our molar mass, we have only one element. We have two of them. We multiply by 16 because that's the atomic mass on the periodic table. And that gives us 32.0 grams. Oh, sorry about that. Gives us 32.0 grams. And so we plug that 32.0 grams in to our t-chart. And it's always equal to one mole. We look at our units that cancel out, moles of oxygen, cancel out with moles of oxygen, and we check to see if our unit matches what we want. It does match what we want, which is good, and so we can plug everything in to our calculator. So it would be 15.0 times 1 divided by 101.96 times 3 divided by 2 times 32 and it will give you 7.06 grams of oxygen, or O2. And we have a completed problem. Let's look at a third one. And guys, I really recommend that you pause the video and try this question on your own before watching how I solve it. So go ahead and pause, and then press play again once you're finished. Okay, so hopefully you have the problem completely worked out in front of you, and let's see if how you solved it is the same way that I solved it. So we start off with what we have and what we want. So we have 7.6 grams of aluminum, and we want moles of aluminum oxide, or Al2O3. And so we start by putting what we have in a chart. So we have 7.6 grams of aluminum. And we bring grams of aluminum down to the bottom, which tells us we need our molar mass. We know that the molar mass of aluminum is 26.98 grams. And that's equal to 1 mole of aluminum. Now we cancel out our units. And we check, does moles of aluminum match this? No, we've got moles, but we want moles of aluminum oxide. And so that means we bring our units down, so moles of aluminum. And remember, once we're in moles, that means we can use our balanced chemical equation or with our mole ratio. There's a 4 in front of aluminum, and we want 2 moles of aluminum oxide from the equation. We cancel out moles of aluminum, cancel out with moles of aluminum, and we check, does this match what I want? It does, so this is actually only a two-step problem, not a three-step problem, and so we can plug everything into our calculator. 7.6 divided by 26.98 times 2 divided by 4, and that gives us 0.14 moles of aluminum oxide and we're complete. Now you can expect to find either grams to moles problems like this, moles to grams so the reverse, 
grams to grams, like problem one and two, or even a one-step problem where it's just moles of one thing to moles of another, or using Avogadro's number on your final exam. But these three examples are similar to what you'll see on your performance final on Monday. So let's continue with a discussion of limiting and excess reactants and chemical reactions in general. So one thing to keep in mind is that a limiting reactant is a chemical that has run out. And the reason why this is the case is because when it runs out, it's going to limit how much product you can make. If you run out of something, you can no longer make it. For example, if I'm making cookies and I run out of flour or sugar, then I have limited the number of cookies I can make by that. Even if I have extra of other ingredients, when I run out of one, my reaction stops. So the, it's the chemical that runs out and there's none at the end of the reaction. And the key thing to keep in mind is to think about what do these chemicals look like or what are some properties of them so that when you're doing an experiment you can say oh this chemical I had at the beginning it's disappeared I no longer see it either because of its color or maybe it's a solid and that solid is completely gone or various other indicators now an excess reactant is the opposite of a limiting reactant an excess reactant is the chemical that um, is left over or there is more of it um, at the end of the reaction um, and this is something that's going to be in abundance you have more than you need and so one thing to keep in mind is when you're thinking okay what is my limiting reactant what is my excess reactant when you're looking at an equation is you need to remember that your reactants are on the left side of your equation and your products are on the right so if you have an option that's written on the right side of the arrow that's a product therefore it cannot be a limiting or excess reactant by their very name they have to be on the left side of our arrow and with that you need to think about how do you know a chemical reaction is even occurring or has begun if you're mixing things in a test tube or a beaker you need to know how do I know a chemical reaction is starting and one thing that you might be able to see is a change in temperature. Um, a change in temperature could result in the test tube that you're holding becoming warm or very cold. But a change in temperature or energy, it could look like producing light, any of those sorts of things. Um, the second thing is you might see an unexpected color change. And the key word there is that it's unexpected. If I add orange food coloring to water, I'm expecting my water to turn orange. That is not a chemical reaction, okay? but an unexpected color change. Now, the third thing that you can look for is bubbles or smoke. Um, these are indicators that you have made a gas. The fourth thing is a precipitate. Now, I know that many of you get confused with this word because it sounds like precipitation, which means rain, but a precipitate is a new solid. So if I mix two liquids together and then at the end I have a solid, or if there was a um, gray solid at the beginning and now there's a purple solid at the end, I've made a new solid and so a precipitate has been made. And then we want to talk about how to speed up a chemical reaction. Because remember, all chemists want their reactions to go faster. We don't want to waste time. And so there are a couple things you want to keep in mind. The first one is you could use a catalyst. And we'll discuss what a catalyst does. But remember, another word for a catalyst is an enzyme. Okay, an enzyme is a catalyst, but it's a catalyst inside your body or inside something that is living, not just inside a test tube. 
The second way to speed up the chemical reaction is to heat it up. Now, that can sometimes uh, go one of two ways, depending on whether or not the reaction is endo or exothermic, um, whether or not adding heat will actually speed it up. But most chemical reactions will heat uh, or speed up if you only heat it up a little bit. Adding too much heat can actually end up um, hurting your reaction. The third thing um, that you can do to speed up a chemical reaction is to stir it. Okay, if you are um, moving the particles around, um, more movement means more energy when those atoms collide, and so the reaction is most likely to occur faster. And the fourth thing that you want to look at um, is a low, or excuse me, you want a high surface area. And a high surface area uh, will come from very uh, small pieces, okay? And this is because if you have small pieces, more surface area, more particles are exposed to so more collisions. And the fifth and final thing is you want something with a high concentration. And again, this is because something with a high concentration is going to have more particles, so more collisions, and your reaction will happen faster. So remember, if you have two bottles of a chemical that you're using, and one has one molar hydrochloric acid in it, and the other has five molar hydrochloric acid, you can be rest assured that the 5 molar HCl is going to have your reaction react faster but, um, than the 1 molar HCl because you literally have more HCl in the solution. Now, when we talk about what a catalyst does, what does a catalyst do? Remember, it speeds up the reaction, but the way it does that is by lowering the activation energy. And remember, the activation energy, or Ea, is the amount of energy required to get a reaction started. So if I want to light a match, I have to hit it with a certain amount of force on the matchbook in order for the re reaction to occur. If you don't have enough energy, it won't start. And so when you're looking at our potential energy diagrams, let's say we have a endothermic reaction here. Well, if we think about this, the top of this hill right here, let's say it's at 100 kilojoules of energy, requires a certain amount of energy to get started. And what a catalyst does is it moves the molecules in such a way that they're going to collide faster. And so it almost provides a shortcut. And so now, instead of requiring 100 kilojoules of energy to get started, it only requires 50 kilojoules of energy. And it, because it only requires a smaller amount, it will go faster. And remember, the activation energy is from the top all the way down to where your reactants are. So you can see that that is much smaller for the catalyst. And when we think about potential energy diagrams, we should be thinking about endo and exothermic reactions. So remember, an endothermic reaction is where heat or energy is absorbed. Okay, now when this happens, the container is going to feel cool. Um, this is because it is absorbing heat even from its container. It's taking heat away. Think about a glass of lemonade. If you put ice in it, the cup starts to feel cool. Cool. That's because the lemonade is absorbing the heat while well, the ice is absorbing the heat from the lemonade and from the glass and the outside air. Now an exothermic reaction is when the heat is released and so in this case the container feels warm and so you could think about a jar holding a candle or a cup of coffee where the heat is being released from the coffee into the air and your cup is going to feel warm Okay, that's an exothermic reaction. An endothermic potential energy diagram has a potential energy on the y-axis and the reaction progress, or essentially time, on the x-axis. 
and your graph will start with the reactants very low. It will absorb a lot of energy, release a little bit, and then you have the potential energy of your products. An exothermic graph is when the potential energy of the reactants is actually higher. It absorbs just a little bit of energy, so that's its activation energy, and then it releases more energy than it absorbs, and then the potential energy of our products is actually lower than the reactants. And so remember, you have potential energy on our y-axis and time on the x-axis. And so this is essentially the kind of topics that you can expect to be asked about on your performance final on Monday. And I hope that you study and you're working on your study guide. And good luck.